Susan, one more time for the very kind introduction. And with your indulgence, everyone, I will make this presentation from the floor. I pulled a muscle like the day before I came to Las Vegas, and it still pains me to go up and down the stairs. So if I, if I may, I'll just do this from here. So once more, um, good morning to everyone. And I will try to make this quick. I know, I think I am the one that stands between you and your lunch. So I will try to make this as quick as I can. All right, so, so the topic, let me just go back to that for a minute. Uh, the topic that I chose to speak on is not medical, 
none of the research that I do, or none of the research that you might be interested in, but a program that is honed from the Philippines, our home country, uh, that is still ongoing now, and I'd like very much for you to be more familiar with it. Uh, that, and the topic, the title that you see on the on my top slide is Balik Puso, Balik Pilipinas, Balik Scientist. And that is the tagline of the program that I will speak to you about today. Alright, so I bring you greetings from Salt Lake City, Utah, where I am based right now. We had a rather harsh winter, as you see from the left hand side of my slide, but I'm hoping that uh, as it turned green uh, in the backyard of my home, of our home, uh, that it continues to do that. And up front, I'd like to thank again the UST Medical Alumni Association in America uh, for the opportunity to make this presentation. And uh, as well, I'd like to thank the uh, PCHRD, and I will tell you more about that later, uh, and the uh, Food and Drug Administration in the Philippines uh, for the opportunity for, to make this presentation to you and to make its appeal. Uh, uh, before I go any further, I wanted to give you my disclaimer. Uh, as uh, Susan indicated, I spent 18 years of my career in the pharmaceutical industry until I retired in 2011, or semi-retired, since I continue to do some work for that as well now. But uh, right, uh, currently, I have no financial ties with any for-profit organizations. Uh, and as a visiting professor of medicine, and as I hold, the two professorial chairs that I have, uh, I, I do not uh, get compensated for any of the roles that I play in, the, in, the, in that role, any activities that I do in that role. And I do conduct mostly uh, pro bono workshops, not just for USD, our beloved alma mater, but also for their collaborating institutions like Edison, uh, University of Perpetual, and St. Louis and the like. As a strategic operations consultant, however, for Intermountain Art in Salt Lake City, I do receive compensation for my services from that institution. And for those who uh, do not um, recognize uh, the institution, Intermountain Health is a not-for-profit organization that have clinical trials ongoing for various indications. And they do uh, clinical trials for various pharmaceutical companies, as well as from the U.S. National Institute of Health. So here are the three test questions that I was asked to prepare. And as we go through the presentation, perhaps we can come back to these three test questions. First one is, only the Philippine FDA can perform regulatory inspections, clinical trials, or research that are conducted in the Philippines. Uh, all the three questions are true or, true or false. Second question is, the Valley Scientist Program, which we are about to talk about, is uh, for medical doctors and healthcare workers who practice in countries other than the Philippines. And the third question, any Filipino can apply to be a Valley Scientist. And we'll go through this as we go through the talk and we'll come back to these three questions at the end and we'll give you answers. Right, so the objective of my, my talk today is really twofold. The first one is to raise awareness of the Valid Scientist Program and its impact on the program participants. And my second objective is to encourage and motivate you the US KMAAA members to consider participation in the Valid Scientist program. And hopefully, I can give you um, uh, tips on how we can do that at the end of the talk. So, I've divided this talk into two parts. The first part is uh, to make you aware of the Valid Scientist program, how it is connected to the Department of Science and Technology which is a cabinet ministry in the Philippines, and how the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, or PCHRD, uh, 
oversees that program. So we'll give you a little, I'll give you a little bit of the background, the purpose, the scope, and the qualifications that are required for the budding scientists. The second half of this talk, hopefully the last 20 minutes, uh, I'll talk about my personal experience because I have indeed been a valid scientist, not just once but twice, and why I had the motivation and the interest to do that two times. I think you will understand at the end of this talk. Uh, so we'll talk about the goals of the two engagements I did for as a valid scientist. We'll talk about the deliverables and the outcomes, and we'll talk about subject matter experts. And this is where I really would encourage many of you to, 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 to be interested in. No? And I'm staring at boy right here in front of me. <coughs> Since, and I'll tell you a little bit more about boy later. Uh, we'll talk about subject matter experts. Uh, we'll talk about the why, the who, the where, the when, the what, and the how you can be a subject matter expert under this program. All right, so what is DOST? So DOST is the Department of Science and Technology. And I know this is a very busy slide, but to the left, I, I describe the DOST as a government agency that has the following mandate. First, provide central direction, leadership, and coordination of scientific and technological efforts. And secondly, to ensure that the results of those efforts that we talked about in that first bullet uh, are geared and utilized in areas of maximum economic and social benefits for the people, meaning for the people of the Philippines. And to the right of the slide, you'll see the three uh, sec sectoral planning councils. And one of them, the one in the middle, is uh, PCHRP. I know I have a pointer here somewhere. Aha, found it. All right, so that middle part is the, the PCHRD, and that stands for the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. There are two other councils under the DOST. PICARD is the first one, and that focuses mostly on agriculture. And to the right is PICARD, which focuses more on electronics and engineering. Yes. The, the DOSD has this sectoral planning councils. And what it does is to get to the left of the slide, provide central direction, leadership, and coordination of all the scientific and technological efforts, and to ensure that the results from that, from that first bullet, are used for maximum economic and social benefits. And there are other parts to the DOSD, the collegial and scientific bodies, right of the slide. <coughs> and beneath the sectoral councils, all the uh, r and institutes that are affiliated with the OST. And to the right, all the other services for science and technology. So that's the umbrella under which uh, the BN, the Humanity Scientist Program, works. So what about the PCHRT? Philippine Council for Health and Research Development was founded in 1982 in the Philippines. And it is, as I mentioned in the first, in the previous slide, one of the three sectoral planning councils of the ELSF, the OSD. It is a forward-looking, partnership-based national body that is responsible for coordinating and monitoring research activities in the Philippines. And its purpose is to regulate, to fund, and I will underscore that word fund, because if you've got research projects that need to be done in the Philippines, this is one council that has the money to fund the, 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 the research that we intend to do. And monitors all of the public research activities in the Philippines. So, what is the Earth Scientist Program? It is a DOSD program that encourages Filipino scientists, technologists, and experts to return to the country, return to the Philippines for a short period of time uh, to promote scientific, agro-industrial, and economic development and to support and strengthen the scientific and technological human resources of the Philippines. So, um, the Medic Scientist Program is not just focused on medicine or on healthcare. It is focused across the board many other sectors 
whatever it is needed in the Philippines falls under this. And you can be an engineer, you can be a doctor, you can be a nurse, you can be, an, uh, you can be in electronics, you can be in agriculture, and you can, uh, for, if you have a project that needs to get done in the Philippines, this is the place where you can do it. So what are the aims of the Belt Scientist Program? When it was first established in the early 1970s, its major uh, goal was to reverse the effect of brain drain. If you remember, those of us who are old and jubilarians will probably remember this, that in the 1970s, there was a perceived brain drain. Many of our doctors, many of our scientists, many of our professionals wanted to go abroad for greener pastures, for better income, and so on. And the one way that the government thought they could reverse that brain drain was to establish the Malik Scientist Program to offer our professionals who live abroad, work abroad, to come back to the Philippines for a period of time and serve the country and share their expertise. The second is so that it can strengthen the science and technological capabilities of the country by these experts coming back home sharing a little bit of their time and a lot of their uh, expertise, uh, we strengthen the science and technological capabilities of the Philippines. Third goal is to accelerate the flow of technologies. And the last goal is to promote knowledge sharing. And toward the end of this talk, I would like to tell you a little bit more about knowledge sharing and how we have tried to do that here during my stint as a Scientists. All right. So here, here's the, but the Belic scientist timeline. Um, I don't want to go through this in detail because again, I'm conscious of the fact that it's time between you and your lunch. Uh, but let me just point out that the Belic scientist program is now under a law in the Philippines. So from 19, uh, from 1975, when it was first established. Under that presidential decree 819, it is now under Republic Act 11035, uh, which gives uh, which gives it a legal stature. It has now become a law. So, what is a budget scientist? And I think by this time, as I talk through the program, um, you picked up what this is. But just to define what a budget scientist is. It is a science, he, this person, this individual, is a science and or technology expert who is a Filipino citizen or an individual of Filipino descent who's residing outside the Philippines and is contracted by the Philippine government to return and work in the country in his or her field of expertise. So that's what the budget scientist is. And I am honored and really proud of the fact that I joined the program and became one in 2019. And to the left of the slide, that's my pinning ceremony, a pin as a body scientist that I proudly wear every time that I give the talk. On my, on my beginning ceremony, that's Dr. Jimmy Montoya. Those of you who went to the University of the Philippines may recognize him. Um, he is the executive director now of BCHRD, of the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. So when I joined the program in 2019, there were only 585 members uh, or body scientists from 1975 when it was first conceived to the current time in 2019 when I joined them. So again, I'm proud to be one of those 585 people across 40 years since inception of the body scientist program in 1975. Here is the annual convention, the year that I joined, and let me find my pointer again. And that's me right there. In the midst of these 500 plus individuals that have chosen 
to, to share their time and their talents by going back to the Philippines for short periods of time. As of now, you know, at, uh, at the end of last year, uh, that number has gone up to 609 Balik scientists. And those 609 Balik scientists have done 783 engagements. So what do those numbers tell us? Some Balik scientists have come back to do another engagement, or to do the Balik scientists think again and again. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, like I did, I did two stints. Right, as a good science. And the future is really uh, nice and, and, and laid out for, the, for BCHRD because they intend to increase the number of the scientists by 10%. And so, from the, well, the Secretariat of the Public Scientist Program, uh, I really bring you a very important message from them. They would like to partner with the U.S. Medical Alumni Association in America to make that happen, to make the scientists, especially in the health sector. Why? Because their intent is that this year they would like uh, to have the scientists for the health sector about 30 uh, slots have been allotted to the health science sector. Right. So who can be a bank scientist? Let's go to the qualifications. I already told you about science, technology, innovation expert, or a professional in that, in those fields, uh, who is a Filipino citizen or of Filipino descent, and number one, is a resident of another country at the time of application, or if that person has gone back to the Philippines, must have been in the Philippines for not longer than three years. So they want the newly, uh, newly returned professionals to be part of this program. Secondly, the, the uh, applicant or the public scientist must be a holder of a graduate degree and must have an outstanding contribution in his or her field of specialization. And uh, the last one, they must be in good health physically and mentally. And in fact, part of the application for the public scientist program is for you to be able to submit a medical certificate from your uh, a healthcare provider, from your primary care physician, that you are fit to work uh, both physically and mentally. So what are host institutions? We cannot just decide to be a body scientist on our own and come back to the Philippines and declare, I am a body scientist. You must have a host in this institution. And so, who are this? It can be a government agency, a public or private academic institution, or a locally registered enterprise that should sponsor you. Um, the institution uh, that undertakes science, technology, and innovation activities, or an institution that does research and development initiatives. And third, that institution should be willing to work with the public scientists and can commit to provide adequate, available equipment, facilities, resources for a productive engagement. So technically, you must have a, a sponsor. So what are the types of engagements? You can do this short term for a minimum of 15 days or to a, to a, ma a minimum, maximum of six months under that short term period. Secondly, you can do this medium term. Six months, but not to exceed one year. So six to 11 months. Or you can do this long term. One year to three years maximum and subject to renewal. So all three engagements, short, medium, and long, you can renew at the end of each engagement. So what are the incentives? The answer to the question, what's in it for the public scientists, apart from being part of a really broad program that can help the country? So the short and medium term, you get your round trip airfare paid for, you get an allowance, daily allowance, and you participate with grants and aids, research, and the development projects as a advisor. For the long term, 
one-way airfare, uh, including your family, if you're doing a long-term uh, engagement. Uh, you get special relocation allowance, monthly housing, and you get transportation. And the last part, uh, again, you get to participate in grants and aid research and development projects, and you can actually be the project leader for this. So, this second half of the talk then, let me tell you about my experience as a public scientist. So, I, again, I did two steps. The first one, both of them short-term engagements, uh, because as you know, I'm still with Intermountain Heart, and I didn't want to give that up just yet. And um, Intermountain did give me permission to spend those number of months that I wanted to, to become a public scientist. So I did the first thing in 2018 to 2019 for two months. And PCHRD allows you to do that staggered. You don't need to do two months straight, 60 days straight. You can do 30 days at the beginning of the year, another 30 days, then the year. That is what you, you intend to do. And then my second engagement was in 2021 to 2022. So I ended the second engagement only in no, December of 2019. Oh, 2022. So how did I start this? Huh? How did I get to know this? Because when this project was first proposed to me, when I was first invited to participate as a budget scientist, I did not know anything about it. Huh? Uh, so it was proposed to me in 2018, and again, the engagement period was from April 15 to 21, was 30 days, and from November 18 to December 20, and another 30 days, so a short period of 60 days. Uh, my host institution was the Philippine FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and they were actually the ones who uh, invited me to be part of the program. And with me in the picture is um, Lourdes Santiago, who is the Deputy Director General of the Food and Drug Administration at that time. And she was the one who extended the invitation to me. And I did the second engagement, as I said, in 2020. Uh, 20, and there were 12 of us that were part of the Public Scientist Program at that point. And why that came about? Uh, and again, that second engagement that I did, uh, this time was for um, 180 days, which was uh, six, which was six months. Uh, we first planned it for two months, uh, staggered engagement. Uh, but then again, guess what happened in 2020? COVID came in. The pandemic set in. So travel restrictions were there. Because remember that if you're a medical scientist. You have to spend time on the ground in, in, in Philippines. And because of COVID, uh, the engagement that, that, that I did the second time around, it did went forward, but instead of being on site, it has now become remote. So all the engagements that I will talk about uh, for the second engagement, all the activities that I'll talk about for the second engagement uh, was indeed um, done remotely. So, a little background why the FDA asked me to do this. In 2018, right before I joined, right before I did the first engagement, the FDA conducted an assessment of clinical trials that were done in the Philippines. And they recognized the role that they play as the national regulatory agency. And they recognized as well that they are the agency that should provide patients with safe, effective treatments. And they also recognized the fact that representation of Filipino subjects was important, that identification of factors that can impact uh, their response to drug or to any kinds of intervention being studied in the Philippines. Uh, and the result of that was the identification of nine areas of focus that would be or that, uh, that were already problem areas. So the outcome that they decided, the outcome then that they wanted was to put together a clinical trial regulatory management program. And here are the nine areas of focus, and I won't go through each one of them, but let me just point out that the reason why 
uh, they invited me to join the program to be a building scientist was because of those first two, the inspection of clinical trial sites and the approval of clinical trials. And uh, it's sad that we are kind of behind the eighth ball in the Philippines when it comes to inspection of clinical trials and when it comes to approval of clinical trials. So they needed more process, they needed more set guidelines and guidelines for this to happen. So those first two were part of my first engagement. And um, the, each engagement is coupled with deliverables. So my first engagement of two months had these four deliverables, uh, revision or input into the administrative order, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, putting together a framework for a competency development program. That's why, um, boy, having <coughs> both my ears glued to how that can be done. It's all part and parcel of what needs to happen in the Philippines as well. And third, uh, providing advice to the FDA uh, on the clinical trial assessments. And just to explain what that is a little bit, when uh, research is going to be conducted in the Philippines, they have this protocol for the research, they have all sorts of uh, documents that are required, and those are submitted to the FDA. And the FDA does not have the expertise in-house to, uh, to, to be able to assess those research, uh, whether it's safe for the patients, whether it's scientifically valid or scientifically valuable, and hence, they have these centers of excellence where they send those protocols, those research to be evaluated. And these centers of excellence have the subject matter experts that I talked about a, a, a little while And lastly, training. Uh, they needed help in putting together training even for the FDA staff themselves. And here are the deliverables that were handed to me for the second engagement. Again, I won't go through each and every one of this. Uh, we'll be here until tomorrow if we did that. So but, so, but I will go through some of the deliverables that I thought would be interesting for you to, to know about. So here's the output that was delivered between my first and second engagement. Um, provided input into the policies and guidelines with the FDA. That administrative order 2020 0010 um, spelled out the guidelines for doing research in the Philippines. Um, the reliance policy is not reinventing the wheel, taking what other countries have done and relying on the, the, on the results of what they have done instead of repeating that research in the Philippines. And the recommendations of the vaccine expert panel. Remember that when we began this, it was COVID time during the pandemic. So they established a vaccine expert panel in the Philippines to uh, judge or to evaluate the vaccines that have been coming in from China, from the Philippines, from the US, and from other countries as well. And so the second bullet has to do with the competency development program. And I will talk to you a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, tools and resources that are for the inspection process as well as the clinical trial evaluation. And lastly, knowledge sharing. So, I did not have to do this alone. The FDA put together a team that could help. I got to lead the team with, again, DDG Lulu. Uh, DDG Lulu down here is the Deputy Director General of the FDA in the Philippines. Um, the three, Sheila, Jade, and Lisa, were FDA officers who put on my team, and Rowena, represented the uh, Rowena and Rosalie who is represented the, um, uh, the, the commercial sector, the pharmaceutical industry and so on. So we had a well-rounded team. And for the second engagement, I had a, 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 another team as well. Uh, and I lost some of the team members from the first. Uh, however, one good thing that happened is that between my first and second engagement, Finally, the FDA had a medical doctor in-house. Remember, uh, it, it, it blew my mind away the first time when I did my first engagement, and I realized that the Philippine Food and Drug Administration 
did not have a single doctor on their staff. And it blew my mind away when I realized that. And we started, uh, and I started asking why, and I started asking questions, and setting it straight. Um, the staff at the FDA at that point in time consisted uh, mostly, almost 100% of registered pharmacists. Not bad, because that's what they're, that's what they're, they're there to, uh, to assess, yeah? and that's what they're there to do, is to evaluate. But, so my second team now had Dr. Iris Tagaro, which is, oops, sorry. Okay, I need to go back. Am I going for white one? Okay, this is my second thing. And this time around, they, they can now have Dr. Iris Tagaro, who's the medical director for the Center for Drug Research at the FDA. And again, we did not have to do this alone, my team and I, because we were allowed to tap into subject matter experts and consultants. So, naturally, I had to go to my mentors at USD, so I have got their pictures with the USD icon. There's Dr. Alora, who I'm sure all of us would recognize, and there's Dr. Dean, the former Dean Grace Gonzaga, and uh, Dr. Consuelo Suarez, down here. I don't think this pointer likes me. All right, but Dr. Suarez, uh, down at the bottom, the bottom right, uh, is the head of research at USD. So, I talked about providing input into the policies. So, the AO 2020 series 010 uh, is really titled Regulations on the Conduct of Clinical Trials for Investigational Product. And I co-authored that uh, administrative order in 2019. It was approved in 2020. It was approved in 2020, and uh, now we're focused on dissemination information. And I talked about the competency development program for regulatory reviewers, first of all. Remember that the regulatory reviewers are from the centers of excellence, where the FDA sends protocols or research for evaluation. And competency, of course, is the ability to apply knowledge and skills and to do something successfully and efficiently. And the regulatory reviewer is really an individual or organization or institution that's duly recognized by the FDA to assist in the review of technical and scientific soundness, merit, and social value, and the regulatory compliance of the clinical program. And we did two of this competency development programs, one for the regulatory reviewers and the other one for the clinical trial inspectors. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the clinical trial inspector program, we're a little behind the eighth ball in the Philippines for this, because whereas the US and other countries in Asia are already doing regulatory inspections for clinical trials, nothing like that was happening in the Philippines. So people, uh, pharma companies will just come to the Philippines, for example, and have protocols done in the Philippines without it ever having to be regulated, without it ever, ever having to be inspected by the regulatory agency. And uh, I'm proud to say that at this point in time, we've changed that a little bit. And last year, they began doing their first clinical trial inspections. Right. So here's the process that we have to adopt from the identification of the competencies that are needed by regulatory reviewers and by regulatory inspectors, all the way down to putting together the core curriculum. And I wish that I had boy on my team when we did that. And down to selecting the faculty, selecting the individuals that will participate in the program. So. I'm going to go zoom through the next few slides because Dr. Greg is just giving me the signal to wrap it up. Okay. So here's the framework that we put together for the for both programs, the competency development programs. And uh, I have to say that uh, it was a challenge because can you imagine doing this, putting together a training program for subject matter experts? So we had 47 of these subject matter experts that would be reviewing clinical trials 
for the FDA attending our session. And those subject matter experts are from those institutions that I have named on, on this slide. And we have delivered this program twice. And um, this program has become so important to the FDA that even um, uh, the Director General of the FDA attends the program when we send it. So he is putting his weight and his support behind these programs. Of note, as I mentioned earlier, we needed to be aware and to recognize the program participants so that they were not just students, not just beginners in their careers, but really people who were high up in their careers, who were subject matter experts in their own right, but just needed to have a, a, a purpose and a process that was uh, consistent across the centers of excellence. So that's the program for the clinical trial inspectors. And again, we did not have to do this alone. We engaged a number of subject matter experts already who are, who are known to industry. And once more, I tapped into uh, my colleagues at USD. And you will see uh, Dr. Dina Jose, who is from class 83 at USD. And of course, my good friend, the Honorable Susan Flores. We followed this through with a series of protocol review sessions. Because you may, our experts may think that they know, you know how to recognize a clinical trial for, for what it is worth, but they don't have a consistent process. And what you need if you're doing it for the FDA is really a consistent process of approaching protocol review. So we did a six-month protocol review workshop. And once more, I, I reached out to our USD graduates Dr. Valenzona is the Head of Research at the University of Perpetual Health, and she is class uh, 91, I believe. And again, Dr. Jose is there, who is from class 83, and my, my other good friend, Dr. Arasen Orton Reyes, who is from our class. And, and, and thankfully, and I'm very grateful for the help and the uh, willingness for them to be a part of this program. We put together a resource library for them, and I, I can talk more about this to some of you if you're interested in this. And the Clinical Trial Regulatory Inspections Manual, which is the equivalent of the BMO here in the US. If you're familiar with the BMO from the US FDA, that's the, the, the equivalent of it that we put together for the Philippines. And of course, we did not only focus on the organizational or the process of clinical research, we also focus on, this, on the soft skills. And we put together a code of, uh, a code of conduct, both for the regulatory inspectors and for the regulatory um, uh, reviewers. And toward that end, we wanted, I wanted to involve a subject matter expert that was not quite close to research, so that we can focus on those skills that are other than research. And once more, I tapped into my good friend, the Honorable Susan Flores. And the last part of this, I want to raise before we end. And my apologies for going through this so, so quickly. Uh, I can see Dr. Greg staring at me, so <laughs> I need to do this. But not the sharing is another one. But, um, uh, and this is really near and dear to my heart. No? Uh, so in, the, in between the, first, the two engagements that we had, uh, we had the opportunity of involving uh, knowledge sharing with 55 institutions. And we did 165 workshops in those eight months, two months in the first engagement, six months in the last engagement that I had. And, and wherein we were able to train 6,155 participants. So if you just, just look at those numbers, that's the impact that you will have if you join the program as a public scientist. We formed several partnerships with many institutions, not just with USD at the top, but several others, as you can see, government institutions, private is, uh, uh, healthcare institutions. Uh, we even partnered with some regulatory agencies in other countries, like Japan, for example, and locally with the uh, regula regulatory agencies surrounding research. 
And along the way, I did find many friends. Uh, several of these subject matter experts I still communicate with right now. If I had any question, I know all I need to do is shoot an email off and I will get an answer back. And we continue to do this. Uh, though, again, those of you who did some work with the University of the Philippines will recognize Dr. Marita Reyes right here to my right. And again, this is DDG, Deputy Director General Lourdes Santiago. Two of the subject matter experts that I partner with and who are always ever willing uh, to come and help us with our programs. And before I ended my last engagement, I did get commitment from six other people, and three of them are already part of the program now. Miriam is from uh, Los Angeles, is based in, in California, and is an executive at ICON, a contract research organization. Jonathan is a professor at the University of the, of the Philippines and um, uh, is now the head of the Technical Review Board of the University of Perpetual Health. Lulu and Erin in the center, Lulu and Erin are both from the Philippine College, uh, Philippine Clinical Research Professionals Organization, and that's the biggest research organization in the Philippines. And of course, I talked to my friend Lilia, who is um, who just returned to the Philippines from France, where she was working in the pharmaceutical industry in France. And um, she's now retired and went back to the Philippines and is now involved in the program. And the last person I talked to and who I still have to engage in one program upcoming is, of course, my good friend and classmate, Dr. Boy Abad. So, in summary, what's the significant contributions that an anxiety can make? First, to the community, via the restrained regulatory reviewers and inspectors whose programs we have put together and who have been trained. The Balik Scientist program contributed to FDA's mission to guarantee safety, quality, purity, and efficiency of products that will be sold in the Philippines. Via knowledge sharing that I talked about, through the workshops that we did, the Balik Scientist program increased awareness and skills for good clinical practice, for regulations, and for guidance for clinical research. In terms of the academia, the Balik Scientist program provided an opportunity to turn the competency development programs into certification or diploma courses. And I'm, I'm in communication with USD now to make those competency development programs real courses, like a diploma course. And lastly, for the country, the Balik Scientist program contributed to FDA's vision of becoming an internationally recognized center of excellence for product registration by 2026. And secondly, it contributed to global benchmarking, raising the level of maturity of the Philippines as a regulatory uh, agency. So here's our post-test. The answers to this, only the Philippine FDA can perform regulatory inspections of clinical trials research conducted in the Philippines. Can I get a show of hands? Who says yes? True? False? False. Because even if the Philippine FDA is the only one that has jurisdiction over clinical research done in the Philippines, any other country can come into the Philippines and do regulatory inspections. If, for, if you are participating in a global research, for example, like global, um, like a global pharma, pharma company sponsored research, or even a private research like the NIH, if you if you're under the U.S. umbrella for that research, then the U.S. FDA can come to the Philippines and do inspections. Uh, of course, because they don't have jurisdiction of the Philippines, you can say no. But guess what? If you say no to a regulatory inspection by the U.S you probably just killed your research career. Because it will be interpreted as you hiding things, you not doing what is right in terms of those research. The, the second one, so we have the answer to that one. The second one, but the scientist programs for medical doctors and healthcare workers who practice in countries other than the Philippines. 
falls, not only for healthcare workers, but for other te technology and scientific areas as well. And second and third one, any Filipino can apply to be a budding scientist under the but scientist program falls because there are requirements as we discuss. All right, so let me end by sharing with you an old Chinese proverb that goes, thousands of candles can be lit from a single candle and the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness never decreases by being shared. And I like to think that that word happiness, we can actually replace with knowledge. That knowledge never decreases by being shared. So hopefully I can give you input. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and brought us happiness.